Oh, my God, I'm going to go to the house. So, 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 I'm going to go to the house. See Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Larita Shivishakan Vitam Shitam Narayanam Namaskitam Naram Chavadan Okamam Devim Sarifatim Vyasam Pito Jayodi Rev Nishta Prayashu Badvesu Nityam Bhagata Sevaya Bhagatiyatama Shakti Bhakti Bhavati Nashtaki Nikuma Kaparu Garitam Param Shukamakara Mita Drabi Samitam Tibata Bhagatam Rashamara Mahora Hori Sikabhavan Krishna Sadama Bhagate Dhamakana He Karuna Stadi Shamasha Parana Kodu Nodi Dham Anartu Pashamam Shakshad Bhakti Rum Lokesha Jana Chakve Satvara Shamanam Atmanamasta Muniyan Nidanti Kara Korbanti Ajikam Nikam Buddha Ganahari Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jatpate Gopi Shagabhika Kandara Kantana Mokshade Jayatam Surido Pango Mamma Maneo Matyagati Matsavacha Param Bhoja Radha Namada Mohaji Sri Man Rasa Rasa Rambi Bamsi Pane Karsham Pane Yasane Pajo Pinasure Saram Divya Bhendara Nikupaturu Mada, Srimad Radhagara Shima Sanisto, Sri Sira Rashida Govindade, Presta Habihi, Seba Manush Manami, Om Maganati Maranda Shanganagana Sarabya, Chaksuru Mini Tamyana Tajmai, Sigurve Nama, Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam, Stapi Tamyana Bhutare, Sayam Rupa Karamayam Dharati Swapanandikam, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pasaya Bhutare, Simadi Bhakti Padanta Shami Tanaman, Namaste Sarasati Devi Guravani Pachani, Nivishes Sanivari Patskata de Sara, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Abe Tikadad Har Shiva Sadi Gold Bhakta Vinya. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari Hari. Good morning, Rob. Are you there? I think you're muted at this present moment. Rob, Good morning, Prabhuji. It was nice to have you on board at the Tuesday night conference call yesterday evening. I was happy to be a part of it. Sorry, I couldn't stay longer. Oh, I hope it gave you a little insight into how we, how we move along and try to organize things to the best of our ability. You're a very good organizer. You're not aware of that about yourself. Oh, thank you, Prabhuji. Sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so we're... Um, revisiting for the sixth time and most likely the last time the 23rd verse in the fifth chapter of the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the beautiful story, the absolute truth. Once again, this is the conversation between the great sage Vyasadeva, the compiler of the Vedas, and his spiritual master, Narada Muni. And Narada Muni, although he's without equal, practically, amongst the sages, he's called the sage amongst the demigods in the Bhagavad Gita itself. Nevertheless, Narada Muni is describing his background, how he came from extremely humble beginnings as the illegitimate son of a single parent, and he lost that parent to a snake bite when he was age five. But nevertheless, due to the um, overriding association of the Bhakti Bhaktivedantas during the four months of the rainy season, he was able to um, complete his Krishna consciousness. Actually, most likely he was a Nitya Siddha, an eternally liberated soul, simply put in those circumstances by Krishna as an example to all of us that there's nothing that can keep you from succeeding in devotional service. There's no material circumstance. There's no low birth. There's no lack of education or parentage or aristocratic upbringing. There is no bar to becoming Krishna consciousness. The only thing that's non-negotiable, that's a quid pro quo, is that one must have the association of saintly persons. If you have good parentage, good upbringing, good looks, you're educated, those are certainly not impediments on the path of devotional service. But they have to be accompanied by the association of the great souls, those who can uh, mentor you, train you, 
familiarize you with the conclusions of the Pramana, the Vedic scriptures, and keep you humble first and foremost. The Narada Muni had that one advantage, and that more than compensated for in terms of all the disadvantages he had. The reason that Krishna consciousness is so powerful that anybody from any situation of life, Sakrim Mana Krishna Paradavan, Nabesan, Tad Dunya De Garam, Nateya Manish Chabaitam, Shrapni Bashanti Chirnish Gatam. It says that anyone who takes shelter of Krishna even one time, it doesn't matter whether they're low born, whether they're uneducated. Um, by virtue of having taken shelter of Krishna that one time, they're no longer under the influence of Maya, the illusory energy, but they're directly under the shelter of Krishna. There's another verse in the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Nabai Janu Jatu Kanchana Vijan Makunda Sevya Anyavad Samsitim Shmaran Makandan Nirukaram Vihatumi Chena Vashagarho Janaha. One who has once served the lotus feet of Krishna, and let's say due to unfortunate circumstances or immaturity, one cease and desist from that service. One does the service for some time and then retreats from that service. Still, one's never the same. <clears throat> you never completely go back to the consciousness that you had before involved involving yourself in Krishna consciousness. The reason for that is you always hanker after getting back to that position again. What is that position? That position is being sheltered, protected, loved, and directed at the lotus feet of the Lord. And those lotus feet are said to be smeared with honey. So many reassurances, so many transcendental instructions for our well-being, so much love emanating from our eternal creator and father. It says that one cannot, having once licked the honey that's available from the lotus feet of the Lord, one can never forget that. One always, on some level or another, maybe in the forefront of one's consciousness, or it may be a deep subconscious urge, but one wants to again taste the honey of the lotus feet of the Lord. A lot of people ask us when we have the Festival of Colors, which we just had last weekend, weekend before last. They ask us, does it bother you that a lot of people come to the festival and they don't know the meaning behind it? They don't come as serious practitioners of bhakti. They just come with a party mood. And our answer is, it doesn't really bother us to be expected in this materialistic age. But our inspiration for holding the festival is that once people come, it doesn't matter what the reasons or the motives are, once they intersect with the holy name of the Lord, and the chanting goes on all day long for seven hours on Saturday, five hours on Sunday, people are caught up in the chanting, the dancing, the eating of cruelty-free food, the, the messages, the uplifting messages referring to the Bhagavad Gita, the wisdom of Krishna from the Song of God. Now, it doesn't hit them like a two by four between the eyes. It doesn't, there's not a light bulb that goes off because we're talking about subtle, sublime spirituality. Most people's tastes are extremely crude, extremely gross, thick and rough, whereas the pleasure that seeps in by hearing the holy name associated with like-minded people and taking vegetarian vegan food is a sublime, subtle pleasure which one is not likely to recognize right away. But on a deep subconscious level, there has been a taste. And one hankers after that taste in the future. After attending the music and the food and the association of the festival of colors, one doesn't quite derive as much pleasure thereafter from attending other festivals and other concerts which are not God-centered. Some or other, the taste has left one for those things if it was ever there in the first place. One sees them as pale. 
and unidimensional, and without substance, and without relish, without taste. When one hankers after being back in that situation which is nourishing for the spirit soul. A common analogy is that you can take a fish out of water, you can give them a nice house, an alpine, cedar hill, wooden hill, thousand oak, good house, good car, good income, good position, a big company. But the fish out of water will never be happy. He really only needs to be back in the water. None of these other things are going to substitute for the satisfaction, fulfillment, and happiness he feels just being back in his original native environment. We are Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema. We are by nature. The truest thing that you can say about any of us is not that we're black or white or male or female or Hispanic or Latin or Christians or Hindus or Muslim. Or Those are all superficial material designations based on the external body and mind. Jayashtu Sarva Sangato Jagatashtur A tribe of Guru Neti Neti Achachan One is not this physical body it is simply like a coat, nor is one the subtle mind, which is compared to a shirt. One is neither one's coat, nor is one one's shirt, but one is the person within the outer garments. So it's explained that we are not this body, and therefore we're not black, white, Christian, Hindu, or mind. We are not the mind. So if you think you're Muslim, Christian, or you think you're a free thinker, you think you're an atheist, it's not who you are. Truest thing that can be said about all of us, you know, there's only specific things we can say about the body because there's millions of different bodies and thousands of different species of life and at least two different genders. Funny story, I don't know if it's relevant or not, but when we originally built the lake, it was a 200,000 gallon lake that was required. Uh, in order to get the permit to build the temple. There had to be that much water <clears throat> on hand in case of a fire. Never mind that there's no combustible materials in the temple. It's all concrete and steel. But still, it's a regulation, so the regulation has to be followed. So rather than having an ugly, unsightly water tank holding 200,000 gallons, we thought we'd build a beautiful, beautiful lake. And so we rented a bulldozer from United Rentals. And by Bobby and I personally learned how to run the bulldozer and gouged out a huge uh, <clears throat> crater just over there next to the temple. Uh, we had some more skilled operators to come in at the end and finesse it. We put it a rubber. We took all the sharp rocks that might pierce the rubber uh, matting from underneath. We put the rubber matting on. We put rocks on top of the rubber matting and we fill it with water. And initially we didn't want a lot of fish in there. We wanted it pretty, pretty, pretty much clear. And so, my Bobby wanted fish. I didn't want fish. And we made a compromise. From our lower little pond, we took three koi's that we had DNA tested were male. So we thought we'll, we'll have we'll just put males in this new pond, and that way it won't get full of fish. So you can still swim, and enjoy uh, your own private reservoir. Well, it wasn't too long before we started noticing babies, and we thought, how in the world did we put three male koi in there? And and we knew they were all male. They were all DNA tested. So how in the world? Well, what we learned later was that in order to survive and propagate, the koi, and, and maybe this is true of other types of fish as well, I wouldn't be surprised, they can change their gender. They can change their gender. We know in human society also you can change through uh, psychological changes and even surgical procedures. You can change from male to female. You can change from female to male. Some people change back and forth every six months. So just like we can change within this life, our gender, uh, uh, we can also change from life to life depending upon our mentality. <clears throat> so there are Many, many different species of life. Jala, jala, navalakani, savara, krima, odara, pachanam, dasamakana. There are 900,000 different types of aquatic. There are 1.1 million types of trees and plants. There are so many different hundreds of thousands of mammals and hundreds of thousands of birds, 
hundreds of thousands of reptiles, and there are 400,000 human species, not all obviously coexisting on this one Earth planet, but spread throughout the universe. There isn't any planet, contrary to what the scientists would have us believe, there isn't any planet which is not teeming with life. Each and every planet has reptile life, it has plant life, it has human life, it has, it has mammal life, it has insect, it has vegetation. The fact that we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there because our senses are conditioned and predicated by the atmosphere of this particular planet. We can't live on the sun planet, we can't live on the moon planet, but it doesn't mean there isn't life there. I, can't, I couldn't live deep within the waters of Utah Lake, but that doesn't mean because I can't live there, no other living entity can live there. So there are 8,400,000 mortus, or different forms of life. But what can be said of all of them, irrespective of the specifics of gender and species, background, nationality, ethnicity, yada, 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 what is true of all of them is that they are eternal spirit souls, part and parcel of Krishna. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema. And unfortunately, in this material world at least, we've forgotten that. There are many inhabitants of the spiritual world who are eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. They've, they're living the dream. They're on the highest platform of perfection, day by day, moment by moment, minute by minute. They're experiencing life as a thrill at every moment. And the reason is, they have, they're not living in forgetfulness of who they are. But as soon as your mind deviates from self-awareness, from self-realization, then you become subject to taking birth in any of the 8,400,000 species of life. The state of your mind precedes your body. Your mind creates your body. What your mind is in this current lifetime, how your mind is conditioned by your choices, the foods you eat, the people that you associate with, the books you read, the movies you watch, each and every choice has an impact on the mind. And the mind is what carries us to the next body. When this gross body can no longer function, becomes old and full of flaws, vital organs cease to function, and it's time to leave. If you're in an apartment, electricity doesn't work, plumbing is all shut, it's leaking, there's no heat, the wallpaper is coming down, the ceiling is leaking, you can't stay there. You have to find another apartment. So old age is nothing more than the deterioration of this apartment, the deterioration of this body. Krishna likens it to a change of clothes in the second chapter of the book. Just like a person takes off old and shoddy clothes full of holes, which no longer adequately cover, conceal and warm the body, Similarly, the soul takes off the old, worn-out, aged body. But the soul does not cease to exist. The soul is eternal. The soul assumes another body. Now, what determines into which womb, into which species of life we enter in our next life? What determines who is our mother, who is our father, whether we're really healthy or ill, animal or human, uh, short or long-lived, I think I feel a poem coming on. I feel a poem coming on. Karma is action and reaction. You sow the seed, you face the deed. Whatever you do comes back to you. The law of cause and effect ensures the balance is perfect, detecting whatever you do, good and bad. It will resurrect. Death is not the end, it's just a bed. Whatever you've done will circle back again. The body may die, but your karma is standing by. You'll be rewarded to live and die. Continue to suffer and cry. As the aroma follows the flowers, heat pursues the fire, your karma will attract you. As soon as you leave the funeral pyre, karma decides how you'll be reborn, comely or scorned, higher you humiliated, straight or deformed, animal or human, sheltered or adrift, healthy or ill, long or short lived. Karma is what makes the world go round. It's cause and effect right down there on the ground for those going over and around, up and down, bound by their deeds, 
down by their needs. What is our purpose on earth? Do we just die and continually take birth? Is there any escape from the pain of coming back again and again and again and again? Yeah, you're not the flesh and you're not the mind. This is our point. You're not the flesh, you're not the mind. If you're not the flesh and you're not the mind, what are you? Eternal spirit designed in the image of almighty divine assigned to a service sublime. If you want to burn up your karma, practice the dharma, pleasing the Lord, fashioned by his hand, acting according to his plan, and never, ever, ever come back to this mortal world again. And we see the path of liberation is to act in harmony with our own eternal, immutable nature. That we are constitutionally servants of Krishna. That is the perfection of our life. The problem in coming to this material world is that we wanted to be master. Purusha prakriti stohi. We are prakriti, but we wanted to be purusha. We're enjoyed but we wanted to be the enjoyer. We're controlled, but we wanted to be the controller. Our mind got skewed, distorted and perverted, some or other, and we came to this material world to try to dominate, to try and live like God, but you can't live like God in God's kingdom, so God very kindly provided this alternative reality for us to take in. Now, in this material world, there are three gunas, three modes of material nature, which are not present in the spiritual world. The word guna in Sanskrit means rope. Each and every living being in this material world is bound by and conditioned by one or a combination of three gunas or three ropes, sattva, rajas, and tamas. Sattva is the rope in the mode of goodness, rajas is the rope in the mode of passion, and tamas is the rope in the mode of ignorance. Uh, if you're in the mode of goodness and you tend to rise as sin to live amongst the demigods, the chief most of which is Lord Brahma. If you're in the mode of passion, you tend to inhabit the middle planetary systems of which earth is one. And if you're in the mode of ignorance, addicted to intoxicating, meat eating, womanizing, gambling, then one sinks down to take birth and to reside in the lower planets. Tamaham disaptaram samsaraja ajasamasham ashurishu eva yomishu. Those who are envious of others, who are mischievous, who try to exploit, who take pleasure in others' pain or discomfort, they gradually sink down to the lowest levels of existence. And those who are compassionate, kind, poetic, nonviolent, they tend to rise up to the position of the demigods. But each and every one of them is bound. If you're living the life of the demigods, you're bound with silken ropes, so to speak. If you're living uh, a hellish existence in the lower planets, you're bound with a crude rope of burlap or some sort of rough material. The goal of life is not to substitute your burlap ropes for silken ropes. We are not of this material world. We have nothing to do with this material world. We are servants of the Lord, but prior to returning back to that eternal existence of bliss and knowledge, we have to cast aside our perverted, unnatural, unhealthy desire to enjoy, to exploit, and to control. We do that very easily without any undue difficulty by reminding ourselves that we're servants and not masters. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. It's all it takes to turn everything around in a 180 degree change of direction. And I've forgotten Krishna, I falsely presented myself myself as a master. I come to this world where every other soul wants to be a master. And depending on how we're influenced by the three modes of material nature, we take birth amongst 8,400,000 species of life. How do we get 8,400,000 species of life? Take the example. I don't know what they are exactly. But yellow, green, blue are those the three basic colors. Anybody's invited to join the chat here. We don't even have a 
so much as a good morning this morning from anybody. <laughs> Got seven people listening, but no notes, no comments yet, which are always welcome. So I know that you're there. If you there and you know the three basic colors, enlighten us. Anyway, the point is that you start with three colors. Three times three equals nine. Nine times nine equals 81. So on and so forth. So you start with goodness, passion, even as you start with just these three modes of material nature, and there are 8,400,000 different combinations of those modes of material nature, different proportions, different fractions of goodness, passion, and ignorance. And depending on how your mind is conditioned and what choices you make, depending on what combination, proportions of those modes of material nature are permeating your polluted, non-God-centered consciousness, that's going to determine your next birth. Whatever we do in this birth is actually creating for ourselves the bodies of our next birth. Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Yam yam vapishmana mara chajate yapriyatshim yati natyushim. As the air carries aromas, so the living being at the end of the previous life has had developed a certain aroma based on his choices and priorities, his pleasures and pains. So that aroma, that mentality survives the death of the gross body. And like the air carries aromas, that mental proclivity, that mental temperament carries one to the womb of a mother and father who have a similar disposition. There are so many fathers, so many mothers, so many species, so many different bodies that we can find ourselves incarcerated in this material world. And the basic reason for all these varieties, all these different deviant forms, is that we have forgotten God. We have, we have lost our pinpointness. We have lost our devotion. Lord Jesus Christ, talking about among other things, focus. When he says the first command is love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. What is he what is he calling us to do? He's calling us to focus. And how do we end up in one or another repeatedly eight million four hundred thousand? Because we're not focused on who we are and we're not focused on whose we are. And this has been going on for a long time. We may have been revolving in the various species of life from the higher planets to the lower planets, bound up by the modes of material nature for hundreds of thousands of births. These are not habits that are broken overnight, but they can be broken by the powerful practice of sadhana bhakti. Under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, one rises early in the morning, one separates oneself uh, from activities which are anathema to devotional service, one gives up illicit sex, gambling, intoxication, and meeting in the interest of purifying one's consciousness, of reducing and minimizing and ultimately eliminating gross materialistic animal attachments from one's life, and one, under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, a realized soul, someone who's himself or herself already fully engaged in the service of the Lord, having been trained up by their spiritual master, all anarthas, all distractions, all things which are extraneous to devotional service, gradually fall away. Anarto Pashamam Shakshad Bhakti Yogan. Anarto Pashamam Bhakti Yogan Nishachad. Loka Shajadatanam Chakra Satpada Samitam. It says, devotional service in and of itself, under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, will be responsible for removing all anartas, anything contrary to getting back to that single pinpointed focus on the lotus feet of the Lord will dissipate, will evaporate, just like the powerful rays of the morning sun evaporate the fog you know, during the a.m. 
out. You need to be confident that there is no doubt uh, that this will happen. This will be the result of getting the shelter of the lotus feet of a bona fide spiritual master. Very quickly, when one is well situated, the illusion of Maya, the illusion of independence, the illusion of ourselves as the enjoyer, the controller, is dissipated to the degree that one's full energy is converted in the service of the Lord instead of in sense enjoyment. And that's the expertise of the spiritual master. He takes that energy, which previously was engaged, dissipated in sense enjoyment, and he converts that energy into the service of the Lord. So it's clear that liberation freedom from the bonds of material nature, um, the resumption of our position in the eternal, knowledgeable, blissful kingdom of God hinges upon this point. One has to get into the service of the Lord's bona fide devotion. This is the testimony of Narada Munis. He's giving to his disciple Vyasa the most valuable lesson that he's learned. He's telling Yasa gave the key, the secret to how it is that Narada Muni is exalted even above the demigods. And it is said that all that glory, all those riches, all that super excellent opulence has derived from the beginning point as well as the ending point of seeking service under the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master. Krishna himself says, Acharyam Ham Navamaita. He says, I am the Acharya. He was serving me 10%. He is my representative. We can't see Krishna. Our senses are too gross, too polluted, too crude. I can't even see the room once my eyelids are closed. I can't see through the wall. I can't see at a distance. The morning, Saturday morning, I was down behind the stage and uh, we had to put some toilets in for the artists. There's a little shed and a costume room behind the stage. So I had parked the truck earlier so we could unload the stage pieces and the flags and set up. But I realized that the truck needed to be moved just a few feet away so there was be room for three rented porta potties to go in there as a convenience to the artist. So um, I had my pair of prescription glasses, which cost me $120, I think, a couple years ago. Um, and I put them on my head you know, when I don't need to read something close. So I was picking up things and moving things out of the way. There were some exhibits and panels. And I was preparing to back the truck up and move it forward, just move it six feet to the left. So while I was doing this and that, and I had my hands full, so I leaned down and the glasses fell off the top of my head under the ground. And I had my hands full. I was going, well, I'll finish this and then I'll pick up my glasses. And some or other, in my senility, I forgot to pick up my glasses. So I put the items that were in my hands away, forgot that my glasses were on the ground, jumped up, turned on the engine of this 26,000 pound truck, backed it up, pulled it to the left, backed it up, pulled it to the left, parked it, and I thought, oh yeah, where are my glasses? I think I just ran over my glasses with a 26,000 pound truck. This is, this is the morning of the festival. And so I, somewhere other in a drawer somewhere, found a pair of $1 glasses from the dollar store. And they got me through. I was able to read a little bit whenever I had to read lyrics to a song, anything like that. It got me through the weekend, but it was a handicap. And the, it, you know, the two days of the year I would like to have good vision were the two days of the Festival of Color. That's what I needed it most, and I didn't. So I was kind of burdened by this handicap throughout the weekend. And then I went and got my eyes checked at the eyeglass place and they did all the tests and measurements and, and uh, they said your glasses will be ready on Friday or Saturday. They hadn't called me, they hadn't texted me, so by Monday I was like, 
I called him. I said, you didn't call me. You didn't text me to say, but I'm calling you because I really want those glasses. And he said, oh, they're here. They're here. It was already checked. So I went over Monday afternoon, and I got these glasses. I'm so happy to be able to see again. So the spiritual master, the bona fide spiritual master, are like the glasses which crystallize, which clarify what is unseen or at most vague, ambiguous, and nebulous. One can focus on, one can see the Supreme Lord specifically and in detail through the transparent via media of the bona fide spiritual master. One's success in Krishna consciousness, the Lord is going to reveal himself to the practitioner in proportion to the degree of service that we render to his pure devotee. So, utilization of the human energy in partnership with the guidance of the bona fide spiritual master is the key to success in this human form of life. It's the pin code which throws open the door of liberation. Mahat Sevam Dara Maharan Mukta Pamodaram Yoshidam Shiva Mahantashamar Vimanya Basuri Dasada Vaza. Christ made this striking statement somewhere in the New Testament. He said, The Father and I are one. It doesn't mean that God and the living beings are interchangeable. It doesn't mean that Jesus was God, as so many people misinterpret it to me means we're one in purpose. He has a plan for all of us. And that plan involves cessation of misery, reestablish ourselves back in his loving, intimate association, um, regaining devotional service in the eternal, blissful, knowledgeable, spiritual world. The Lord works on our behalf to get us back to where we should be. That's his plan. And when we agree to cooperate with the Lord and spread his name, fame, glories, share with people the good news, the gospel, if you will, the Bhagavad Gita, we, we become one. We become identical with the Lord through service, through seva. And the seva is channeled through the discipline session. Just like electricity is accessed by the plug and the outlet. The outlet is the end result of all this arrangement, all this infrastructure, beginning from the sun, ending in a big power, power dynamo, a powerhouse. From the powerhouse, there's a grid. From the grid, there are wires, fiber optics, and it all comes, all that huge infrastructure appears seeming very innocuously like a little plug on your wall. But as soon as you plug in your heater, you plug in your iPad, uh, you plug in your hair dryer, you get the benefit of all that infrastructure. So similarly, God is everywhere. There's nothing false in that statement. But we can't access him in his all-pervasive aspect. We have to plug into the outlet of a bona fide spiritual master. Why? Because the expert spiritual master knows the art of utilizing everything to glorify the Lord. And under his guidance, the whole world can be turned into the spiritual abode by the divine grace of the Lord's servant. When I first came to Krishna consciousness back in 1970, I heard devotees referring to Prabhupada as his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And there was something about that term that seemed slightly grandiose, slightly pretentious to me, until one day the Bodhi explained to me that it means that the spiritual master is the grace. He's the mercy energy of the Lord appearing before us. It is says, Yata vairana bandanyam bhagavan marchasthayaram bhavam shranam anugrahanam siram rupa charadhyam God appears in human society for reclaiming the fallen souls, for instructing them, illuminating their path back to home, back to God. In what form? How are we to know, to expect, to search out for the form of God 
who walks amongst us for our benefit and for our ultimate liberation. We are to find God in the form of his pure devotees. That is how God's mercy manifests itself before us. He says, Shwanam Anugrahanam. Anugraha means mercy. Shwanam means personal. He says, My, if you want my personal mercy, don't look for me. I am too exalted, too far away, I'm too subtle, too sublime. But I extend myself to the fallen living beings for their ultimate emancipation in the form of my pure devotees. And the pure devotees walk, they crisscross the earth simply canvassing to pick up fallen conditions. When you connect with such a purified representative of the Lord, you become one with the Lord. Everything about your life, your singing, your talking, your walking, your eating, your association, your recreation, everything about your life, the nature of it is transformed just in the same way that gross bell metal is transformed in association with touchstone through an alchemical process. Base metal can become gold through alchemy. So the alchemy of bhakti is that one heart, one's hard, arrogant uh, heart, uh, which has disregarded the Lord for many thousands of lifetimes, gets melted in the association of a lover of the Lord. And in that association, one's energies are transformed from pursuing the, the shimmera, the phantasmagoria of sense gratification to once again attaining the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord and returning back to home, back to Godhead, where life is eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. Thank you for being with us. I'm not sure who you are. Maybe a fault in my Facebook but I don't see a single comment. Nevertheless, be it as it's may, uh, we put that knowledge, we put that sound vibration out there to purify the atmosphere. And this uh, discussion will be permanently situated on our YouTube channel, as well as on our Facebook page for anyone who wants to access it. But at any time you want to make yourself known, of course that will be encouraging and inspirational for me. Nevertheless, we will continue to go on doing our duty, which is to keep the Lord first place and use whatever abilities of speech, whatever mental abilities we have, cent for cent in the devotional service of the Lord. Any final comments, Rob? You're on mute right now. Are you in a position where you can unmute yourself and give us a benedictory um, quote? Thank you, Prabhuji. Um... My takeaway today is to remember that I am a spirit soul, um, part and parcel to Krishna and, you know, same in quality, just not in quantity. Um, and I need to remember not to bind myself by the ropes of, uh, of the modes of material nature, but uh, I can only do as good as I can do in this lifetime. So I just have to strive to, to progress. And in a culture in which everyone is encouraged to enjoy, to dominate, control um we have to learn how to do the opposite our our cultivation is is not um the same as the mainstream I'm trying to cultivate humility trying to cultivate an attitude of service that that in fact is the key to being liberated the key to uh manifesting all of our good divine innate god qualities but it's swimming against the stream as far as popular culture is concerned. And I have to say, Rob is such a good servant. Oh my God. I saw him in action with the Festival of Colors in Salt Lake City and Spanish Fork. And he is amazing. He's magnificent. So thank you, Rob. I think you, I think you have all the assets of everything you need to make the transition from the world of birth, death, disease, and old age to the eternal spiritual kingdom of God. And you're too kind, Prabhuji. Whatever way I can assist, you please never hesitate to tap me.
Same thing for any of those who may be out there, although I don't have any comments. I think it's just probably some of the new Facebook today. Um, thanks very much. This has been Wisdom Wednesday, the last of six sessions on this powerful testimony of Narada Muni to his disciple, Vyasadeva. We'll get back to you on Monday with the 24th verse. No, the with the uh, tw yeah, 24th verse, 5th chapter, first count. Thank you once again. Don't forget to chant Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare.